Hi, I'm Eric Siegel with Eric'sTrains.com. Today we're going to take a look at the new 3-rail O-Scale Pensy 6446S1 passenger set from MTH. Okay, so I'm going to start things off with a little bit of history on the S1, and then after that we'll get into MTH's model. The S1 was a single experimental steam locomotive that was built for the Pensy in 1939. The design and construction of the S1 was a collaborative effort undertaken by the Pensy, Baldwin, Lima, and Alco. The streamlined design of the S1 was, of course, the brainchild of famous industrial designer Raymond Lowy. At 140 feet in length, the S1 was the longest and heaviest rigid frame reciprocating steam locomotive ever built, and it was also the largest passenger locomotive ever built. The S1 was the only locomotive ever built with a 6446 wheel arrangement, and of course 6446 means that there are six wheels up front, four drive wheels here, four more drive wheels here, and then six wheels on the trailing truck. And speaking of the wheel arrangement, one of the flaws of the S1 design was that while the engine was extremely heavy at almost 276 tons, less than half of that weight was supported by the driving wheels. The rest of the weight was supported by the six-wheel trucks on either end of the engine, and this made the S1 very prone to wheel slippage when in operation. Wheel slippage can be a potential disaster for a steam engine, so the engineers always had to keep a very close eye on things when running the S1 to prevent excessive slippage. Now, not only did the S1 have issues with the weight distribution on the wheels, but because of its length and the fact that both sets of drivers were attached to the frame and there was no articulation, the S1 required very wide curves and it required a lot of clearance on the sides of the track. And that is something that would haunt the S1 throughout its career. I'll get to that in just a minute. And interestingly enough, the requirement for wide curves and a lot of clearance is something that carries through to this model, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes as well. So, as I said, the S1 was built in 1939, but before it entered revenue service for the Pensy, it made its way to the 1939 New York World's Fair, where it was placed on display. For the purposes of the World's Fair exhibition, the S1 had the words American railroading across the tender instead of Pennsylvania, and then once the World's Fair was over and it went into revenue service, they removed the American railroading and put on the Pennsylvania logo. There are a couple interesting facts about the S1's presence at the World's Fair. First of all, in order for the S1 to get to the location of the World's Fair in New York, it had to take a very circuitous route, and that was because of the big clearance requirements that the S1 had. So they couldn't just take the fastest route, they had to take a roundabout route using lines that had the necessary clearance. Secondly, while the S1 was on display at the World's Fair, they had rollers underneath the drive wheels so that the engine could actually be powered up and operated while on display. Pretty cool. Anyway, after the World's Fair, the S1 went into revenue service for the Pensy, but as I already said, the S1's great length and weight meant that it could not negotiate the track clearances on most of the lines in the Pensy system. And so for its entire service life, it was restricted to the main line between Chicago, Illinois and Crestline, Ohio, hauling passenger trains such as the General and the Trailblazer. And this MTH model is fashioned after the Trailblazer. Now, even though the S1 had limited use, it was apparently very well liked by the crews that ran it. It was said that the massive size of the engine resulted in a very smooth and enjoyable ride. But since the S1 did have limited use, it did not enjoy a very long career. The last reported revenue run for the S1 was in May of 1946, and then the engine was finally scrapped in 1949. 
Okay, now that you know some of the history of the real S1, let's talk about the MTH model. This latest rendition of the S1 was made available in the 2013 Volume 2 MTH catalog, and then it finally shipped in July of 2014. Now, there are a few different options available if you want to buy one of these. You can buy the engine by itself, and in that case, there are two different versions. There's the Pensy 6100 version, like you see here, and then there's the American Railroads version, like the one that was on display at the World's Fair in 1939. You can also buy the set, which is what I have here, and that consists of the Pensy 6100 and then four 70-foot Pensy passenger cars. Let's go over some quick stats and facts on this set. The length of the engine itself is 25 and a half inches. The combined length of the engine and the tender is 36 inches. The length of each of the four passenger cars in this set is right at 17 and a half inches, which works out to a scale 70 feet, so they are right on the money. The weight of the engine itself is 12 pounds 1 ounce. The weight of the tender is 4 pounds 13 ounces. So that gives us a combined weight of 16 pounds 14 ounces. Yeah, this thing is big. And then each of the four passenger cars weighs in at about 1 pound 12 ounces, give or take. Let's talk about the pulling power of this engine. You would think from the massive size and weight that this thing would pull three or four pounds easy, but it pulls right at two pounds, which is good, but it was a little bit surprising given the engine's size. But what's interesting is that this model suffers from the same problem that the real S1 suffered from, and that is wheel slippage. You've got these drive wheels in the middle, but then you've got these big six-wheel trucks on either end. And like the prototype, once you get to about two pounds of pulling power, you start to get some slippage in these drivers. So actually, I think that's really cool. It makes it feel more like the prototype. Another way in which this model is very similar to the prototype is in its minimum curve requirement. Just like the real S1, this thing needs wide curves and a lot of clearance. The minimum curve listed on the box is 072, and I'm here to tell you that that is no joke. This thing needs at least 072 to be happy. If you try to run it on anything less than 072, forget about it. And to be honest, it's barely happy on 072. In my opinion, this thing really needs 081 or 099 or higher to really shine. Under the hood, the S1 is equipped with MTH Protosound 3.0 for command control and sound. The engine is powered by one large flywheel motor, and then up in the front, there's a fan driven smoke unit for the smokestack. This model also comes equipped with DCC. However, since it is a three rail model, you're probably not going to be using DCC at all, so it's sort of a moot point. This set is loaded with great details and features, so now let's go in for a closer look. Here's a look at the front pilot area of the S1. There's not a whole lot to see because of the streamlining, but what is there is very nice. We've got this really cool pinstriping. And then we've got some steps up here and a separately applied horn, a very legible trailblazer banner. And then right here in the middle, this section pops out to reveal a coupler. It's not the easiest thing in the world to get out. But let me go ahead and give it a try. There we go. And then once that's out, there's a dummy scale coupler that folds up like that. Now, if you want to double head the engine, you can replace the dummy scale coupler with this dummy O-gauge coupler that's also packaged with the engine. When it comes time to reattach that front plate, what you do is fold down that dummy scale coupler, like that, and then we'll grab that front plate. And if you look, there are metal clips on each side. And so all you have to do is push it back in and those metal clips will hold it in place. Moving past the pilot area, you can get a good view of the first six-wheel truck, and you can see it's nicely detailed. You can also see that striping continuing. It goes all the way down the side of the engine, and then you can see some nice cast-in details up here. Moving back, here's one of the four cylinders on this engine, and then we've got the first set of drivers, and these drivers look great. They've got this really nice looking spoking on them, and then as we move back, you can see the second set of drivers. 
Here we have the trailing six-wheel truck, and as you can see, this one looks a lot busier than the front set. And then above that, we've got these holes here with metal screen in them. I'm not sure if you can see the metal screen on the video, but it looks great if you get down there close. Moving around to this beautiful torpedo-like front, you can see that there's not a lot going on here, and that's pretty much the story for the entire engine, and that's because of the streamlined shrouding that was added. But there is a separately applied grab iron down here, and an operating headlight right here in the middle. As we start to move down the side of the boiler, you can see another separately applied grab iron here. There's safety tread on the walkways. We've got some nice rivet detailing here. You can see one of the operating marker lights and a lighted number board, and of course they're on the other side as well. You can see the start of the handrails that move down either side of the boiler, and then of course there are legible builder's plates on both sides. As I said, there's not a lot to see on this engine because of the streamlining, but on this side of the boiler you can see the throttle linkage. It starts back in the cab and then works its way up to here. Here's a look at the cab area. You can see the front window right here. The side windows look great and they do have clear plastic inserts in them. The doors also have clear plastic inserts in them. And the doors open up like that and they are sprung so they'll snap back shut. There are three separately applied metal grab irons on each side. There's one above the window and then one on either side of the door. The area underneath the door looks great with these inset steps and then we've got these inset areas over here as well. If you take a look in the cab, you can see the two hand-painted crew figures. The interior of the cab is illuminated. There is a very detailed back head and there's a red glow in the firebox when the engine is in operation. Now let's take a look at the top of the S1. Starting up in front, there's this little circular screen piece, and I have no idea what that's for. And then we've got some cast-in detailing here. And then right here are the twin smokestacks. Now, there may be two smokestacks, but there's only one smoke unit down in there. And of course, to supply smoke fluid to the smoke unit, you simply pour the smoke fluid down either one of these stacks. Moving back, again, there's not a whole lot to see up here because of the streamlining, but we do have some nice casting details and then some hand-painted pop-off valves right here. As we get back toward the cab, we've got some nice casting detailing here, and then there's a vent on the cab roof which opens up like that. Here's a look at the back of the cab. Starting at the bottom, we've got the, quote, wireless drawbar that MTH uses. Then you can see a little bit of the interior of the cab here. You can see some of the nice detailing on the back head. And then we've got this add-on detail piece up here. Here's a look at the underside of the engine. There are two pickup rollers, one, two. And then on the rear set of drivers, there are two traction tires. All right, so that takes care of the engine. Now let's take a look at the tender. Starting at the bottom, there are some very nicely detailed die-cast metal truck side frames. There they are. And then as for the sides of the tender, well, I think they kind of speak for themselves. Here's a look at the front of the tender. It's pretty typical for what you see on most O-scale steam engines these days in that all of this detailing is cast in. However, you've got this recessed area here that gives it some depth, and so it looks really good. The back of the tender looks great. There are lots of separately applied items like grab irons and ladders and so forth. There are two operating marker lights up here. There's a legible sign right here. The steps down here look great. And then of course here in the middle is the protocoupler that can be thrown from the DCS remote. The top of the tender looks great. There's a wire handrail back here. The entire deck is very nicely detailed. There are six opening hatches, three over here and three on the other side. Underneath this hatch is the master smoke volume control. Underneath one of the hatches over here is the master volume control. And then there's another hatch with the switch that toggles between DCC and DCS control. There's a nice ladder right here. And then up on top here is a real coal load. Finally, here's a look at the underside of the tender. There's some add-on detailing here, and the speaker for the sound system is right here. Now, there are no power pickup rollers on these trucks because the tender gets its power through the tether that connects to the engine that has the pickup rollers. 
Here's a look at the gap between the engine and the tender. It measures about an inch, so that's a scale four feet, so it's not terrible. I think it would have been better if they had put some sort of a deck plate going between the engine and the tender. That would have made it look a little better. But overall, it's good, and you know, nobody's perfect, so I'm okay with it. Okay, so that takes care of the engine. Now we're going to take a look at the four passenger cars that come with this set. These passenger cars are typical MTH Premier Line passenger cars. Those of you who already own some know exactly what I mean. They are very consistent. MTH has been putting out these passenger cars for a long time and they are very high quality. You get a lot of bang for your buck, especially if you buy the set because you get the four passenger cars for $100 extra. That's 25 bucks a car. I'll take that deal any day of the week. These are great cars, especially for the money. They've got die cast metal sprung trucks, lots of separately applied grab irons, nice diaphragms on the end, and of course, interior illumination. So first up, we've got the baggage RPO car. It's very nicely done, as you can see. All of the doors on the sides of the cars open up, and of course, on these front RPO doors, they've got these mail hooks. Now, for you kids out there who may be wondering what these hooks are all about, back in the day, the railroads used to deliver a lot of the US mail via RPO cars, or railway post office cars. And the trains would often go through small towns that had mail that needed to be picked up. But rather than the train having to stop at each of these small towns to pick up the mail, what they would do is place all of the mail that needed to be picked up in a bag, and then they would put that bag on a hook next to the rails. And then the train would come by at high speed and grab that bag with this hook. And that would allow the train to pick up the mail from a small town without having to stop. Up next, we've got the first coach car, which is named Colonial Congress. The doors on each side of the car open up. They've got some nice passengers on the inside of the car. And here's a shot of one of the ends of these cars. And as you can see, it looks great. Here's the next coach car in the set, which is exactly the same as the previous car. The only difference is the name on the car, which in this case is City of Wilmington. Finally, here's the observation car. It looks great as you can see. We've got some marker lights on the end and then we've got the trailblazer drum head right here. Here's a look at the underside of one of these passenger cars. There are two pickup rollers, one per truck for good solid electrical contact and there's a good amount of underframe detailing. Okay, the last thing we're gonna do before we start this thing up is BFIMO, best feature in my opinion. Well, my pick for BFIMO this time around is going to be the whistle sound. It's really great, and it's got a good quill to it as well. It kind of reminds me of a big hollow whistle that you might hear off in the distance at night. It's got a real comforting sound to it, and so that's why for BFIMO this time, I'm going to pick the whistle. All right, let's go ahead and start it up. Now, I'm going to be using the extended startup sequence, which plays some crew talk sounds and so forth. But keep in mind that if you don't like those type of sounds, you don't have to use them. You can just do a straight startup that skips all that. Let's get her steamed. Spout over. That'll do it. How's she firing? She's in good shape. Ready when you are. Okay, first up, let's check out the whistle. And now let's check out the bell. And now let's check out some of the crew talk sounds. And as always, if you don't like them, that's okay. You don't have to use them. Welcome to Inglewood. 
Welcome to Crestline. Welcome to Fort Wayne. Welcome to Lima. Okay, let's go ahead and roll it out.
I'm going to blow her down. Clear? Clear. Okay, that about wraps it up for this review. This is a beautiful set pulled by a gorgeous engine. And if you've got a layout with curves that are wide enough to support this engine and you like the Pensy, well, this may be the set for you. Now, if you're interested in purchasing this, the engine by itself retails for right at $1,300. And then the set, which consists of the engine plus the four passenger cars, retails for right at $1,400. So for a mere $100 more, you get four Premier Line passenger cars. That is a great deal, and you can't beat that anywhere. And so for that reason, I always recommend getting the set when it comes to MTH. Now, these sets are available for sale right now from today's sponsor, which is the Train Loft in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. You can find them on the web at www.trainloft.com or give them a call at 336-760-9817. Anyway, that's it for now. I'm Eric Siegel, and I'll see you next time. To discuss this model or any other O-Gage trains and to meet other O-Gage modelers, check out the O-Gage Railroading Magazine online forum at ogrforum.ogagerr.com.